Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> Our next reader is Matt L. Rohr. Yeah, Matt is a writer. Matt is a writer and musician living in San Francisco. His writing has appeared in Tinfish, Watchword, and the Surfer's Journal, and other publications. He's a founding editor of Small Desk Press, Small Desk Press in the house tonight, and works as a substitute teacher. You can find his music at www.myspace.com slash Golden West Service. Please welcome Matt L. Rohr. Thank you, Kevin and Amy. Do you guys want to fill up that big gap up here? That'd be really sweet. Kevin will buy you all free drinks. No, no, no. Okay. So I'm reading from a project called the Matt Rohr Project, which I've been working on for 27 years. And um, it's a mixture of narrative and poetry. Easter. <clears throat> At the dinner table, I told my mother that the kasha tasted like bad childhood memories. My brother said, it's okay, just a little bland. My grandfather died of a heart attack when my mother was 13. I think of this every time I eat brisket. Supposedly, mustard cuts down your cholesterol intake, so I eat more mustard than meat and don't ever worry. My psychology is a little gray cloud trying to dissolve. Sitting on the couch with my father in the dark, our conversation idles and the walls shake. I strum the nylon string guitar. His mother was psychotic and he was born, after he was born, and underwent shock treatment. She had a love affair with the famous 50s playwright. This gives me more than literary cred and a person to look up on Wikipedia. My psychology is a set of rules that I may or may not have heard at the dinner table. <laughs> Spring cleaning. If I can just type fast enough, my room will clean itself. Empty glass jars and black socks will levitate shakily. They'll begin their orbit around the center of the room, gaining momentum. A small tornado will form and I will be typing furiously in the center. My facial muscles will loosen and my jaw will hang perfectly limp while the vortex of dailiness spins around me. As letters and spaces fall into place, objects in the room land where they belong. A poster mounts itself over the hole in my wall. My cell phone lands, plugged into its charger. The coins fall in the aluminum cup, holding all small things without homes. Guitar picks and spare buttons. When I write a bad line, the surfboard fin wedges into the wall. When I revise, it dislodges. The wall heals itself. I correct my grammar and shirts that have been worn but don't smell bad enough to have earned a wash fly out of the hamper, <laughs> landing folded in their proper crate. The cyclone contracts when I pause, closing in on me, tightening my thoughts. When the clicking keys resume, the cyclone expands, sliding against the edges of everything, smoothing out my bed sheets, buffing scuffs from the paints on my, paint on my door. When I place the final period and put my computer to sleep, my books arrange themselves al alphabetically on their shelves and wait patiently to be read. This one's called Bros. <laughs> Orion pulls onto the sidewalk in his five-speed Toyota truck without power steering. Wrenching his small arms against the wheel, he half smiles, half coughs as he comes to a stop. Oh, Matt, he says, like he wants something but doesn't want to ask for it. What's up, man, I ask, reminding us that even though we want things from each other, we are both still men. <laughs> oh, Matt, 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 he says, and this surge of annoyance moves through me. What's up? He's saying my name as if it will exhume the evil spirit of his ex-girlfriend, who is not dead, but I can't think of any new suggestion to help him stop obsessing over her besides some type of supernatural paranormal assistance. He seemed bummed, I say, as I slide onto the bench seat behind, beside him. He shakes the shifter around a few times before popping it into reverse, looking at me in the eyes and letting out a sigh. 
dude, what's going on? I laugh. I call him dude to remind him that even though I care about how he is feeling, we are both still dudes. <laughs> the car's body is vibrating against his frame as we slowly idle backwards into the street, dropping off the curb, rear axle, then front. I farted, sorry, he says. And another half cough, half smile. I shake my head and wait for it to hit. Orion's fart smell like shoes that have been worn without socks for several summers. His shoes smell like that too. In fact, he's the only person I know who wears shoes without socks for several summers. His blue van, scraps of canvas stitched together with dental floss, congealed sweat, and shoe goo filling the spaces between. Perhaps his footwear's odor somehow leaches up through his legs and into his stomach, coming out in his farts. It doesn't bother me that much, though. In fact, they smell better than your standard eggy or spicy fart. It might be that when you have smelled someone's farts consistently for many years, they begin to not bother you, just like your own snot doesn't gross you out when you see it in the tissue. Matt, 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 I'm sorry. And he leans over to hug me, letting the gears grind with the truck blocking half the 42nd Avenue. I pat him on the back and fake a laugh. We should get going, I think there's cars coming. The truck is shaking and shaking, and I realize that the truck is actually still, and it is Orion who is shaking, heaving against my chest, crying. He pulls his head away and wipes his tears with his index finger, sniffling. My flannel shirt, moist with a mixture of Orion's tear, snot, and my own sweat, hangs heavy and awkward on my shoulders, wrinkling down towards my butt where it disappears, pinched between the rough gray fabric of the truck's bench and my jeans. I will have to have it dry clean now. I think about painting the walls of the truck cab white, how that might make me feel lighter in this moment. I think about how I never cry in front of my friends, but cry too much in front of my lovers. I think about my father weeping when he found out that he wouldn't be able to retire for 10 more years. I think about saying something vague and hopeful like, it'll be all right, or in another year you'll be crying over a new ex-girlfriend, or for a door to open, sometimes a window must close, some crap like that. <laughs> Sorry, man, I blurt out, reminding us that though he has shared his tears with me, we are both still men. I saw her last night, and it was obvious that she doesn't love me anymore. It was just obvious. Yeah, I say. I feel a lot better now, though, he says. I'm holding my breath as he pulls the shifter into first and pushes his weight into the gas pedal. You can applaud if you want. <laughs> this is the last one I'm going to read. June 24th. I was born on the dinner table, which makes me part of a meal. The wood grain on my birthing table contains portraits of ghosts. Let me start over. The wood grain on my birthing table contained portraits of ghosts, complete with sunken eyes and erratic vibrating pulses of hearts that were not quite beating. I came out of the womb with my disgusting beard full of amniotic fluid, chunks of placenta, my mother's stew. The ghosts sang to me the story of their lives in pictures. I heard their images stream through my baby head, only they seemed to leave out plot points. No major events or climaxes. In fact, there was no rising or falling action, and it was just everyday nothings they showed me. Thousands of hours in bed alone or with a partner. The rhythm of sidewalk square, the rhythm of <laughs> passing sidewalk squares on the way to the bus. Walks in the woods with a white yellow sky poking through the tree branches. Masturbating in the morning shower. Writing on the steamy window with a fingertip. The way the drips were drawn to each other with gravity and determination, falling hard into love with each other's ions. The ghost sang to me millions of chewed fingernails, trips to the acupuncturist, sharpening pencils, washing bowls, spoons, staring at the wall in the therapist's office. A fisherman's ghost sang to me almost entirely in images of water. There were different textures and motions. Fine ripples with almost indiscernible gaps between the divots in the surface, like a thickly woven fabric. There was water like mirrored glass, and water teeming with violent wind chop. A farmer's ghost sang to me the side of his wife's hefty stomach. The warmth from the sun prying through the curtains as he rose every morning, 
firmly planting his arms across her on the bed, creating a bridge of his body, carefully maneuvering as to not wake her up. He could slip his legs over her one by one and exit the bed without touching her or letting much cold air under the covers. These ghost stories would sometimes overlap, and I would experience the most beautifully vivid gray. A child's ghost sang of a windowsill with white latex paint, the sweet smell as he sunk his teeth into the gummy corner. One woman sang of fluorescent bulbs flickering overhead. She was closing wounds with dental floss and a sewing needle. Thank you.